Becoming Babe Ruth by Matt Travaris. Baltimore, 1902. George Ruth lives with his parents and his baby sister in a tiny apartment above a saloon. Most days, he skips school and roams the streets. He steals tomatoes from a vegetable stand and throws them at passing wagons. He sneaks into the saloon and takes money from the register. Finally, when he is seven years old, his parents decide enough is enough. On June 13, 1902, George stands with his father outside St. Mary's Industrial School for Boys. Tears well up in George's eyes. He squeezes his father's hand and begs him for one more chance. But it's too late. St. Mary's is a school, not a prison. But the 800 boys who live there call themselves inmates. Every day the inmates wake up at six o'clock sharp. They wash, get dressed, go to church, then hurry to the cafeteria. They eat breakfast in complete silence. If they talk, they might get whipped. They eat the same food every day. They go to class, they go to work, they follow the rules. George does not like following rules and he does not like going to class. He misses his parents and his baby sister. But there is one thing that he does like about St. Mary's. Almost every day after all his work is done, George gets to play baseball. One cloudy afternoon, George is playing ball in the little yard where the younger kids play. When someone in the big yard shouts, Brother Mathis is going to hit, the game stops. George grabs his glove and runs after the other boys. Brother Mathis jogs past the crowd with quick pigeon-toed strides. He stands at home plate and tosses a baseball into the air. Then, holding the bat with just one hand, he takes a gigantic uppercut swing that sends the ball soaring high above the big yard, over the outfield, beyond the trees. He repeats this magnificent act again and again. George pushes his way to the front. He has never seen anything like it. Years pass, and after a while, St. Mary starts to feel like home. George has lots of friends. He works in the tailor shop and becomes an expert shirt maker. He plays in 200 ball games a year, even in winter, even when he has to shovel snow off the base paths. Brother Mathis sends, spends countless hours teaching George how to throw a curveball, how to turn a double play, how to pick off a runner at first. George learns how to play catcher, short stop, and every other position on the field. He practices and practices. By the time he is 16, George is the biggest, strongest boy at St. Mary's and the best ball player, too. He strolls toward the plate. The pitcher whirls around. Back up, he yells to the outfielders. They are already running. Someone in the outfield yells, George is going to hit. The younger boys run from the little yard to watch. The pitcher winds up 
George takes a gigantic uppercut swing and sends the ball soaring high above the big yard, way over the outfield, beyond the trees. The boys watch in amazement. George circles the bases with quick pigeon-toed strides. One day, George hits three home runs in a game. Another day, he strikes out 22 batters. As soon as the game ends, still in his baseball uniform, he joins the school band in the bleachers and pounds away on a big bass drum. Crowds of people come to watch him play. They tell their friends about him, and their friends tell their friends. Soon word spreads all the way to Jack Dunn, the owner of the minor league Baltimore Orioles. On February 14, 1914, Mr. Dunn goes to St. Mary's and watches George pitch for 30 minutes. He offers him a contract right then and there. Two weeks later, George says goodbye to his friends. Brother Mathis shakes his hand. You'll make it, George, he says. He opens the gate, and George walks out. Outside the gate, everything is new. George gets to ride on a train. He gets to stay in a hotel. He gets to eat dinner at a restaurant. Where'd they get this kid? one of his new teammates asked. He's one of Jack Dunn's new babes, another teammate replies. After that, they all start calling him Babe. Soon, even the newspapers are calling George by his new name, Babe Ruth. The season starts and Babe Ruth is one of the Orioles' best pitchers. Some days he plays for the Orioles in the afternoon, then rides his bike to St. Mary's and spends the evening playing ball with his friends. He plays so well that halfway into the season, the Orioles sell his contract to the Boston Red Sox. On July 10, 1914, he boards a northbound train on his way to the major leagues. Before long, Babe Ruth is the best pitcher in baseball. In 1916, he leads the league with a 1.75 earned run average. In 1917, he wins 24 games his team wins the World Series three times in 1915, 1916, and 1918. In 1919, the Red Sox switch Babe Ruth to the outfield to keep his powerful bat in the lineup every day. With his grand uppercut swing, he launches home run after home run high into the right field bleachers. Back at St. Mary's, Brother Mathis and the boys read about him in the newspaper every day. On January 5, 1920, they are shocked by the front page news. Babe Ruth has been sold to the New York Yankees for $125,000, the largest sum any team has ever paid for a baseball player. Babe Ruth arrives in New York City in the spring of 1920 and quickly becomes the biggest celebrity in the biggest city in America. A flock of newspaper writers follow him everywhere he goes. He wears fancy clothes, custom tailored just for him. He drives fast cars and throws wild parties. He eats enormous amounts of food. He does whatever he wants to do. And 
He clobbers the baseball like nobody ever has. Halfway into the first season as a New York Yankee, he has already broken baseball's single-season home run record. All across America, baseball fans are mesmerized. They have never seen anything like it. Everywhere he goes, people cheer for him. Newspaper writers make up new nicknames for him. The Batter, the Colossus, the Sultan of Swat. But there is bad news from Baltimore. A fire has swept through St. Mary's Industrial School for boys. Nearly every building has been destroyed. Babe Ruth has an idea. He writes a letter to Brother Mathis. On September 8, 1920, Brother Mathis opens the gates and 50 inmates walk out carrying tubas, trumpets, trombones, and a big bass drum. For the final two weeks of the 1920 baseball season, the school band from St. Mary's goes to join the New York Yankees on a road trip across America. They get to ride on a train as special guests of Babe Ruth. He invites them all to the dining room car and buys everybody ice cream. The 50 boys from St. Mary's get to go to all the games. They play a concert in the stands before each game and another concert every night. Babe Ruth is at every show. Huge crowds attend the concerts, eager to meet the babe in person and happy to donate money to help rebuild the place where the Sultan of Swat learned how to play baseball. Back in New York, Babe Ruth strolls toward the plate. He sees Brother Mathis sitting in the grandstand with the boys from St. Mary's. He waves and tips his cap. The boys' faces beam with pride. Years later, Brother Mathis is playing ball with a group of boys in the little yard outside the newly rebuilt dormitory. Someone in the outfield yells, He's here! The game stops and all the boys run to the big yard as fast as they can. George tosses a baseball up in the air and takes a gigantic uppercut swing that sends the ball soaring high above the big yard, past the outfield, beyond the trees. The boys cheer with delight as he repeats this magnificent act again and again. And that is the end of Becoming Babe Ruth by Matt Travaris. There's a nice nice author's note, and there are some statistics on George Babe Ruth. I hope you enjoyed this story.